Today it's my, my privilege, my honor, to introduce Dr. Thomas Peacock um, of the Fond du Lac Ojibwe Nation. Um, he's a faculty emeritus at the University of Minnesota Duluth, um, but is currently teaching over at Winona State University. He received a BS from Bemidji State, uh, a master's in educational administration from the University of Minnesota, a master's in education from Harvard, as well as an education doctorate from Harvard in um, education administration, planning, and uh, social policy. He's co-authored and edited several books, including um, a couple of my favorites, Collected Wisdom and uh, The Seventh Generation. Um, and one of his uh, articles most recently published was on, um, in, in Tribal College Journal, talking about some of the lessons we can learn from tribal colleges and racism. And so within that theme, and to try to um, uh, bring that infusion um, into our dialogue, I've invited, uh, had the honor of, of inviting one of the most respected voices in Native education, uh, Dr. Thomas Peacock. So I told um, Ryan that I was going to try to very loosely stick around the topic that he, he must have had to put posters up or something like that. And, I, <laughs> and then, I, then I worked up a topic, and it really doesn't look much like it at all. Um, so, so anyway, this next part, you're going to have a quiz on it at the end, and it's going to be part of your, uh, your uh, state graduation exam, I understand. Okay? Ani Niji Bamadizi. Chibanein indigena cause, Tom Peacock and indigena cause, Jaganashamong, Nindunjaba, Nagajawanang, Nungum, Miskwabikang, Minawa, Rochester, Minnesota, Ninda, Makundundude, Niminoyagi, Nimuenda, Mama, Ayayan, Nungum. I always um, remind people that um, uh, of our beautiful language our beautiful language, which at one time was spoken all the way from Newfoundland, all the way uh, down to the uh, uh, Virginia at one time. Uh, when this uh, country was first colonized by uh, the Europeans, um, that was uh, pretty much a common language all up and down the East Coast. Um, and uh, it was a language that, that probably was uh, first spoken to the um, when the native people first met the Europeans. And so, um, and it's probably spoken by less than 20,000 people um, right now. So I think of it when I think of um, things like the English language movement um, and the people who tout the English language movement um, who say that, um, you know, this is an English speaking country. And uh, it makes me think of that because, um, you know, our native languages. Um, were, were born here. You think of that. Uh, every, every word um, that I spoke originated here. It originated here. You know, when, when our people saw um, uh, everything around them, they, they needed words for it. In the English language, of course, the words came from somewhere else. And so if there is to be an official language um, in this country, it should be our native languages. Does that make sense? All you native people in the room, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So when I hear things like English only, of course, you know, to old 60s radicals like me, you know, who cut, cut off my hair and got a BMW and sold out, <laughs> like the rest of you older people here, um, you know, that's what I think about. It, it, I, I get angry just like I did back then, um, that, that uh, someone would dare say um, that my language uh, doesn't have value. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And um, in the way that I kind of do things like this is um, I'll talk a little bit and then I ask, um, I ask for like readers because sometimes um, it can be best said uh, either through things that I've, that I've written um, it, um, and then I'll give it a little context. Does that make sense? That way you don't have to listen to me all the time. And so it's more like a reading than anything else. And so Ryan has a, uh, has a microphone. And uh, people who have a good reading voice, um, you can use like your best teacher voice or whatever you want to use. Um, and, uh, and we'll do that. Um, the article in Tribal College Journal, and probably, you know, Ryan is probably the only person in the room who probably read it. Um, but, but it was about, they asked me to, um, to write something about race and, uh, and about racism. And, and I had written a, a middle school book on racism. 
And uh, it's written like through a native lens. And so there are a lot of materials out there uh, written about racism and about issues of race. And, and, and I've done a number of books with a small press in Minnesota, um, mostly Ojibwe history and culture kinds of things. And, and they asked if I was interested in doing another book. And I said I'd like to do one. And they wanted me to do something on bullying because bullying's kind of a big deal nowadays, I guess. I mean, it's always been an issue, right? How many people in here have ever been beat up before in the bathroom of a school? Uh, well, I'm, I was one. How many people have beat someone up in the bathroom of a school? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I can keep my hand raised in both because I've been on both sides of it. But, but so they wanted me to do something on bullying, and I said, you know, um, I'd really like to do uh, something on racism. Um, because you know there's a, there are a lot of materials out there for young people on race and about the civil rights movement and all of that kind of thing, um, but I wanted to take it and sort of put as many things as I could in it about race and and racism and what young people can do about it and things like that and put it in a in the thinking and in the voice of uh, about a seventh grade reading level. So that's kind of what I did, and that's kind of what I do with the kids' books that I write. Um, is that, is that I try to take very complicated topics and put them in a language that young people can understand. And, and so I did this book called To Be Free. And of course, it's, it's named after uh, uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream uh, speech called To Be Free. So, so that's what that is. And, and they must have gotten a copy of the book somehow, or like a review copy. And then so they, they called me up and asked me if I'd do an article, the Tribal College Journal. So I went ahead and did that. And uh, just to give it context, there's another uh, this beautiful, beautiful um, saying um, in uh, in my language um, that I use every once in a while because it really, it really um, you have to put yourself in a certain mindset when you sit down uh, to write about things. And I think about uh, where we've come, you know, since I was a little kid, and 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 where we are now. And we've come such a long ways, of course, and we've we've come nowhere at the same time. We've um, in, in many other ways, but it's in Bago Sein Dam Noon Goom Gawin in Bamad in Dizin. Today I have hope, I do not despair. And uh, so written, written through that context. So I need a reader uh, for this first one because um, um, I, um, when I was born, I was born. Um, um, in a time when uh, in, in, um, my family was living uh, with our grandparents. Um, uh, they lived, uh, they lived uh, way out on the res. Uh, there was no road uh, going into where they lived. Uh, of course, we had um, no running water or uh, that, any of that kind of stuff. We heated uh, with wood. Um, uh, there, was, uh, there was a path that went through the woods um, that, that came to the to the place, and so I actually was born in the hospital, um, and uh, and then uh, born in the middle of the winter, and and they uh, they pulled me home in a toboggan um, uh, toward the end of January, and uh, so it was a very very different kind of time, and and my my grandfather was Ojibwe, my grandmother was a full blood Irish, uh, first generation Irish, and I have to tell you that. Um, um, you know, it was also during a time when, you know, of course, racism was kind of way right out there. And, and she was um, pretty much, um, 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 she, she had to leave her family uh, when she decided to marry an Indian man and, and move out to the reservation. Her family pretty much disowned her. And so she spent the rest of her life, um, you know, living, uh, living on a reservation and, uh, um, she's the one who, uh, who taught me all kinds of superstitions, right? And I, re I do have to say something about that because uh, a few years ago, uh, my wife and I, we've taught in Sweden and in England. And uh, when we were in England, we made several visits to, uh, to Ireland. And it was just like going to visit my grandmother's home. It really, really was. And she's been dead for many, many years. And it was really nothing quite like uh, going into uh, homes in Ireland because um, that's all I could s smell, that's all I could see, that's all I could hear uh, what was, was her. It was really amazing. And so I have that obviously in me, in me because I'm mixed blood. 
um, so Irish and, uh, and Ojibwe. But my grandfather, um, you know, um, it was a time before, uh, before what we call self-determination. It was a time, you know, when our tribal councils were really non-existent. I, as I remember, when I was a little kid, one time going to the council meeting, um, they, the tribal council was raising its money having bingos, and uh, they had a total budget of about $400, and, um, and that was kind of about it. So very, very, very different kind of time. No jobs. Um, uh, my grandfather made a living, um, uh, made, basically lived off the land. They, they lived off what they could. It was before welfare. Um, before food stamps, before government commodities, um, lived off deer meat and rabbits and fish uh, and that kind of thing. When I was eight and nine years old, um, our parents would send us um, uh, up the river uh, for three, four, five days uh, with brothers and sisters, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, to, to camp and hunt and fish uh, for days um, with the canoe, with 22, with enough uh, bait, that kind of stuff. Um, nowadays, social services would be uh, up there, <laughs> would be up the river looking for us, and uh, we'd be in foster care somewhere. But you know, it was a very, very different kind of time, and that was just normal. Does that make sense? Um, that makes sense. Those of you who grew up in farming communities or grew up on a farm, you know exactly what I mean. You you accepted the responsibilities of adulthood at a very, very early age. So let's um, let's let's have a reader um, uh, read something. Um, about my grandfather, okay? And it's called Not a Chief, and uh, put it in the context of racism. So we need a reader, a volunteer reader. The, the weight, it has to go much quicker. One, two, three, there we go. We have a read. Right through, right from here. Okay. Down <laughs> Go ahead and have you in the brackets. It's in English, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, better get comfortable. Not a chief. My grandfather lived off the land by snaring rabbits and catching catfish from the river. There were no jobs on the reservation, no burgeoning tribal infrastructure in which to apply for work or services no tribal college to attend to gain the skills we deem necessary to live the American dream. We were poor before poor became part of the social and economic lexicon. My grandfather lived culture before it was considered cultural, before we had made a curriculum out of it and taught it in our tribal schools and colleges. He lived treaty rights before we knew it as treaty rights, when it was simply a way to live. He knew nothing of lobbying Congress for more appropriations for Indian education, nothing about applying for scholarships or grants. He didn't own a three-piece suit. He wasn't a professional Indian. He just was. He was part of an era and ancestors I admire. It was a difficult period and period and people may do with whatever they had in front of them and they survived and they kept our stories and language and ways inside them so it could be passed to us. During summers, to make money for smokes and cheap wine, he hunted for golf balls on the nearby private country club that adjoined the reservation. The country club was built on land illegally taken from his grandfather's, my ancestors. Sometimes, as a young boy, I would accompany him when he approached the local mill executives who were golfing to sell them the golf balls he had found. I remember they called him Chief, and when they said that, he would look down at the ground in silence. Even as a young boy, I knew the word was mo mocking and denigrating. Even then, I knew he was shamed that they would call him that in front of his grandson, and that he did not protest in anger. In my dreams, however, he says that is not his name, that we have a name for our leaders. Ojima? Ojima, and the word is sacred and powerful. So, so I spent a summer um, in 1993, I'm a historian, and I spent the summer uh, working in the archives, um, National Archives in Washington, D.C., looking for anything about my home community at Fond du Lac. And um, so 
So I was digging through the education files. I was going through the social service files, the central office files, the Bureau of Indian Affairs files, basically the Indian agents um, who lived in, who sort of overlorded the different Indian communities. And the second, um, the second file folder in education that I opened had a letter, and I wondered if we could have a reader for, for this letter. Sure, we have a reader. You're going to keep busy walking around. <laughs> if you could read that, that would be great. <laughs> uh, okay, the letter is written to uh, an official in Washington, D.C. My dear sir, I'm writing to you asking for your permission so I can keep my sons uh, at home this fall. My health isn't very good, and as I haven't any nearby neighbors, um, I must necessarily uh, engage with someone at home, have someone at home with me part of the day. There are some very good schools that they can attend. My health is so impaired that it is impossible for me to do the work that it is required on the farm, hoping for a favorable response. I am respectfully Mrs. Elizabeth Morrison. Yeah, Morissette. Morissette. Mm -hmm. So that was the second, uh, the second uh, file folder that I had opened. And, uh, and of course, I started reading the letter, and I immediately went down to the end of the letter. I don't know what it was, but I went to the end of the letter. I saw that it was signed by Mrs. Elizabeth Morissette, who was my great-grandmother. And um, those of you who know anything about the history of the boarding schools uh, know that um, the, the government used, um, um, like if you didn't send your kids to boarding schools, they would withhold your rations. Um, so, so they didn't have any choice because, you know, by then our communities had become dependent on, on rations. Um, the means of traditional livelihood had, had been taken away. And, and so... Um, um, in, the, in the two sons that you were talking about, uh, the eldest was, was my grandfather. And, um, and in that same winter, of course, there was a flu epidemic. Now, these flu epidemics that went through our communities uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, they'd claim like half the communities. So there were, um, in the epi particular epidemic, I think it was, um, that went through that winter, um, there were like 614 people living in our community, and, and they lost um, 300 and some. Um, all the elderly people and all the babies, basically, and then leave the middle, and, and that's kind of how those epidemics worked. And she was claimed by that, of course. Um, her, her boys, including my grandfather, was sent, to, was sent off to boarding school. Um, so I had never, ever even known, I had known who she was because I, you know, in the reservation cemetery, of course, there are the markers there, and I knew where the markers were, but I was never able to identify uh, before um, that. So that's, that's the kind of, um, the kind of racism um, that they had to deal with. So a few months ago, um, just before I was working on, on this particular article, uh, my brother Sonny um, sent me um, a, a, a picture of my grandfather. And um, the first thing that I noticed is that um, the picture that he sent me, I had no pictures of him. Um, uh, I'm the same age as he was uh, when that picture was taken. That's the first thing that struck me uh, about, that, about that picture. And it made me think about um, the fact that you know, now um, I'm becoming an elder. <laughs> I write kids' books, so, um, you know, those of you, you know, I, I've gone through the tenure thing where you write all those stupid scholarly articles <laughs> um, that, that nobody reads except the students who you force to read. So um, now I get to write what I feel like it. And uh, so I write kids' books. It's a lot of fun, by the way. about being an elder. 
Do we have somebody who would like to read about being an elder? And I promise I won't give anything that's difficult <laughs> anymore. I, I didn't do that on purpose. Sorry. Right here. This one? Yeah. I am now considered an elder on my reservation. That means I qualify for reduced price lunch lunches at the elderly nutrition program, preferred parking at the tribal center, free snow plowing in wintertime, reservation-sponsored trips, and the annual elders Christmas party. If I wished, I could ask to be moved into elderly housing. I'm unsure how I would feel about all of that, except to say, I don't feel like an elder. It seems just a season ago that I was a little boy who spent my summer days running and playing in the woods. And it seems only one winter, winter has passed since I was sledding with my brothers and cousins. In my dreams, I still help my grandmother haul water from the spring. The seasons have passed so quickly. My heart still sings the songs of my childhood. I still feel but a child. Thank you. So, so now that I, I have to become an elder and suddenly become wise, I do a lot of listening. And uh, in my quest to become wise, could you read another one? <laughs> Just keep the mic over here. <laughs> this one's called The Fourth Hill. We try to visit elders when we are in Red Cliff, sometimes just to check on them, to see how things are going. My wife always brings them food. Most often we just sit and listen to, the, to them tell stories about other times and people and of their life. I learn so much that way, especially now in the long winter months, I think of them. Already once this winter we have traveled there to help send one of our elders off to the spirit world. I know too I am growing old. I feel it in my bones when I stand to leave their homes. I see it in the gray of my hair. But when I am with the elders, I am like a little young boy again. That is how special they make me feel. Um, writing these kids' books, by the way, is so much more um, um, fulfilling than uh, writing uh, journal, scholarly journal articles, <laughs> I have to say. Poetry is better than it's, it's prose is so much more, so much more fun. So, so that was like the time of, 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 of my grandparents and such a very, very different kind of time. Um, uh, I'll tell you this one. Um, it, it's a fun story and, and if you're native, you'll understand the humor and if you're not, it'll probably shock you, but that's okay. Um, um, my, my wife and I, we, we own a place, uh, we, we have a place in Redcliffe um, out in Little Sand Bay and, and um, her, one of her, one of her aunties came to visit us. Her auntie and one of his sons, and his uh, his son's wife, uh, came to visit uh, one day. And of course, we were all sitting around the table, uh, talking, and um, and uh, and uh, my wife asked uh, her cousin there. You know, um, he said, she said, uh, uh, when are you going to think about moving home? Because I think he was like living in Chicago or something like that. And he said, he said, oh, he said, I'm going to move home pretty soon. He said, um, um, he said, I'd like to, I'd like to move back home and hang around with this guy. And he, he was pointing at me. He said, because I want to, I want to do some writing. He said, I want to learn how to write. And he said, I figure if I hang around this guy, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to, he'll be able to show me how to do some writing. And um, and his his mother, uh, the auntie, is like almost 90 years old, and she was talking, and she was talking about, she was telling all kinds of stories, and of course we were listening, and one of the stories she told was um, was that um, she has blue eyes, and um, she was talking about my mother, and my mother had blue eyes, my own mother had blue eyes, and, and when my mother first started, uh, my mother's from Fond du Lac, but when she, she used to start coming over to Redcliffe, um, she... Um, They'd, uh, uh, that was back in the day before Indians could be served in bars. Um, and because they had blue eyes, they could get served, right? So, so they bought the booze for everyone on the res. <laughs> and, um, 
and, and, and she was telling all these wild stories, you know, and, and then, and then her, the son that she had with her, um, she had with uh, one of her earlier boyfriends. She never married, never married um, that one. She said, well, I married this man, but, but my heart is still with this, this other man that she had a son with. Of course, the husband never knew that, but what the heck. <laughs> and, and then my wife said, uh, she said, well, she, and then she looked at the cousin and she said, well, when you come home, she said, uh, I don't know. She said, uh, I've been with this guy for almost 15 years. And she's pointing at me. She said, and I haven't written anything yet, so I don't know if it's going to do any good. <laughs> and she said, but when I do, I'm gonna, I have a book I'm going to write. And they look, all looked at her and they said, what's it going to be about? She said, I'm going to call it When Elders Were Sluts. <laughs> <laughs> and... And the, and, um, and the two, uh, the cousin and the, his wife were just shocked. I mean, they, they were just stunned. And the, and the auntie was just laughing so hard. Um, she stood up and she went walking over to the couch and she dug through her purse and got out her puffer and went, shh, shh. and she said, you leave me out of it. <laughs> it was so funny. Has nothing to do with racism. I just had to tell this story. <laughs> so this is kind of like a story. That's kind of like how I, um, how I've been giving uh, talks like this. There's a little, uh, a little bit of serious mix, mixed in with things are not serious, and and that's kind of the way that we do things. So, um, so my own generation, I, uh, like I said, you know, the, where we grew up, you know, we didn't have um, any of the modern kind of conveniences and, and we'd walk the uh, couple miles uh, wherever we, wo we wanted to go and, um, and I remember I was about four years old, I went to my first um, movie. There was this theater in town called the Chief Theater, um, probably named after my grandpa. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, we went to the Chief Theater and I saw my first cowboy and Indian movie and and um, so there I'm sitting there, and I'm this little kid, and I, I, it, I couldn't tell the difference between what's real and what's, 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 what's movie, because I'd never seen a moving picture before. And so I thought what was going on, on the screen was really happening. And um, there were these, um, the settlers were picking Indians off as they were like canoeing down the river, and I thought it was real. And so I was hiding behind the seat screaming because, um, because I thought, well, I was going to get hit. Yeah, I was going to get hit next. And um, so, so that was one of my first experiences going into town. And then, um, and then I experienced one of my very first Halloweens. We need a reader. See, even Indians, we learned how to celebrate Halloween. Would be right here yeah. to right here. Got it. And like I, and like him, I too have lived my life having to deal with the everyday denigration of ignorance and racism. When I was a young golf caddy, these same men also called me chief. Their children called me other names as well. Redskin, wagon burner, Injun. Even the ones who adopted me as some kind of pet, whom I thought were my friends, called me an honest Injun. One Halloween, a group of us reservation kids, too poor for masks or costumes, went to town to trick or treat only to return with what we thought was a popcorn ball wrapped in tinfoil. There was a note inside. Go on home to the reservation. I wish I was there now. We've tried that with town kids, but we don't know what kind of, what to write on the in inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll always remember that because, um, you know, um, um, when we all got home, of course, you know, the first thing you do is count all your candy bars. You kind of separate them all out, right? 
with from all the other junk and you throw the apples away and um, <laughs> and of course we tore into that what we thought was a popcorn ball and that's what we got we each got one uh, one of those one of those things one of those notes and it's really funny but um, um, we didn't say a word we did not say a word we just kind of threw it aside and didn't say anything and uh, and I'll always remember that uh, that's kind of how we dealt with things like that back then. So through high school then, um, it, was, it was the time before, um, before um, any kind of, a, kind of an awareness. And then um, um, as a junior in high school, um, we started having uh, like fights between white kids and Indian kids. And, and um, of course, we were outnumbered about 10,000 to three. And so it wasn't much of a contest, but some of the reservation kids were getting beat up and like thrown down the stairs. Um, and, um, and so we decided to have a walkout. And um, so, you know, about six of us, um, we walked out of the school, we held a walkout and we went out to the tribal center um, because they had a pool table. And, um, and that's what we did. We went out and we played pool for a couple of days and then the assistant principal came out to try to talk us into going back to school and we had to get him to promise that um, he was going to do something about you know, us getting uh, picked on. And, um, and so, so we did that and, and um, that was the very, very first time that I got involved in anything uh, like that where, where I was going to directly uh, confront uh, any kind of injustice um, that I saw. But most of it was kind of just like for excitement. And so um, the following spring, um, at that time, um, uh, anybody familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, activism, with uh, American Indian activism uh, during the late 1960s, and I can't remember the year at all, but um, we started um, a carload of us going down to the, uh, the Friday night um, uh, meetings in Minneapolis, and it's, it was a time before the freeway uh, was built. There was no I-35 then, it was uh, US-61, and we'd, we'd take it down and we'd go to the uh, American Indian Movement um, um, Friday night meetings because um, they were just getting organized, and, um, and they had organized as a street patrol because, um, because um, um, the, uh, the Minneapolis police were um, were uh, picking on uh, uh, um, Indians who street street people, basically uh, the alcoholics and street people and and other Indian people um, um, that hung around on Franklin Avenue and hung out on Franklin Avenue, and they were abusive and they were doing things like. Uh, rather than you know haul before they'd haul them off to detox or to jail, you know throw them in the back seat. They they were doing things like you know putting them in trunks and transporting them and and doing uh, some pretty denigrating things like that. So AIM got its start kind of that way, and we'd go down to their meetings and and um, and so I was never you know very very active. I was kind of in it for the excitement because it was a very very exciting. Uh, kind of time, and I was still a kid. I was about 16 years old, um, but I got to become part of um, um, when the, when AIM took over um, uh, all at the same time. Took over a series of uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs area offices, and I got to be a part of uh, the Minneapolis area office takeover. And I, I'll always remember that because um, you remember certain little things from it. And like one of the things that I remember is that I got to make all kinds of long distance phone calls. Um, <laughs> Because we had, um, because we had access to to telephones, and uh, of course I didn't really have very many people to call because not too many people that I knew had telephones, but the ones that did, I got to call them from a BIA telephone. So I remember that, and and um, uh, it was uh, my some of my cousins and my uh, sister and I. And um, we'd use uh, my younger brother, who was 12, as like a decoy. I don't know if, when you were kids if you did this. Um, but, but to kind of get away with things, we'd tell our parents that we were going to go down um, for the AIM meetings. Um, but we'd bring our younger brother along to show that we were going to behave ourselves. So we decided um, when we were all in there, and he was 12 years old, he had no idea what was going on, um, that we were going to go out and get something to eat. So, at, you know, this was the, all the 
the riot police and everything, they were still letting everybody like leave and come back. There was there was no, you know, they, they didn't they didn't take come in and, and drag everybody out of there. We went out to get something to eat and while we were gone, the riot police moved in and hauled everybody out of there. And he ended up in jail. So he's twelve years old and he's in jail in Minneapolis and it's on a Sunday. And we had to try to figure out a way to get him out of jail because we had to get home by Sunday night so we wouldn't get into trouble. All right? And um, I have no idea how exactly we went about the thing, but we did end up getting him out of jail, and we got on a Greyhound bus and made it back home so we could go to and be in school. And so it was a very, very different kind of time. I don't know if anybody remembers um, living during that kind of time, but... Uh, it was pretty exciting. It was the kinds of things that um, we've kind of lost. Um, those of you who were involved in activist movements like that, uh, we've kind of lost that, that kind of energy somehow. Um, but it was a very, very exciting time. It was a, it was a contradictory time as well um, because there was a lot of corruption um, within the movement um, at the same time. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. It's well, because we're people, because we're humans, we're filled with contradictions if that makes any sense, and I'll, I guess I'll just leave it at that. So, so I eventually became a high school principal. Can you imagine that? And, and Ameri first I was a history teacher. Um, can you imagine me teaching American history? And then, uh, and then I moved on and became a, a high school principal, and I became a principal of a school in Minnesota, Cass Lake uh, High School, which had just um, been uh, found guilty of violating uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Um, for discriminating against uh, American Indian American Indians, and I was voted in by the school board to be their first Indian principal on a four to three vote. Um, a four to three vote. Uh, the four Indians on the school board uh, voted for me, <laughs> and um, and the superintendent um, wouldn't talk to me for 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 months. He wouldn't ever wouldn't say a word to me. He he obviously wanted somebody else. And uh, he didn't start talking to me until uh, one day he had, uh, and the district office was located in the high school, down in his corner of the building, he happened to walk outside his office for once, and um, there were three Indian girls there who wouldn't go to class, and they were picking on him. <laughs> and um, and so, the, so the intercom goes off, and it's the superintendent saying, Mr. Peacock, there are three young ladies down here who won't go to class. And so I walked down there, right? And, um, and they go to class, I get them to class, and, and then I, I gained his respect then. Um, so so that, that changed from that. But at that point, at that time in the community that we lived in, um, there was a large group of people who were members of Posse Comitatus, the, the white supremacist uh, organization. And, um, and uh, I would bring in a uh, Holocaust speaker every, every spring um, to, to talk in front of the entire school, and I always had trouble with this with this group of parents um, because they'd they'd come in and see me and they'd say, you know, um, uh, we understand you're going to have this Jew uh, Holocaust speaker come in, and um, um, you know uh, we believe that all of that Holocaust stuff was made up by the U.S. government. It's just government propaganda, and um, um, and so. Uh, we'd like you to give uh, our kids passes to the library that day. And so they'd, uh, they'd come in every year and ask for that. And I'd say, no, um, that's part of the curriculum. That, that, um, that, so all these kids would be missing on that day. That, that makes any sense. So we'd go through that every year. And then, of course, their older kids would come in and see me at the same time. And they'd tell me word for word what their parents had taught them. And, and I... I remember telling one of them that I had my father's um, uh, uh, army uh, photo album. Um, uh, after uh, Dachau was liberated um, and after the Americans arrived, um, um, they, uh, many of the American troops took all kinds of pictures of what was going on there, right? And he had his photo albums filled with those pictures. And I said, if you'd like, I'll show you, uh, I'll bring them his photo album and show you the pictures. And, uh, and he said, of course, said no. He, of course, said no. So I understand I only have an hour, and I'm using up all my time telling stories. Um, so what am I going to do? Shall I just continue for a few minutes? 
Yeah. Okay. Hey. So um, a few years ago when I was teaching in Sweden, I looked down my notes every once, so I have to skip the long sections that it happens, you know. Um, when you do talks like this, I teach, you know, the classes where all teachers, right, many of us, um, teach for like three, four hours at a time. And, uh, and then we have to try to figure out how to say everything in an hour, it's just impossible. But uh, a couple of years ago, we were teaching, and my wife and I were teaching in Sweden, and while we were teaching in Sweden, we, we, uh, we led a, um, um, uh, a group of uh, students, international students from all over the place. We were uh, co-directors of a study in Sweden program. Can you imagine that, two Indians um, <laughs> being co-directors of a study in Sweden program? Um, actually, the university couldn't get anybody to do Sweden. Everyone wants, wants to do um, studies in like really interesting places. It, Apparently Sweden wasn't exotic enough. And so we had these two Indians that wanted to escape from Duluth and so we ended up <laughs> we ended up in Sweden. Um, but anyway we took we took them on a we, we, we took them on a uh, a tour uh, of the um, of the death camps in uh, in Poland and uh, and we went we went to Warsaw, uh, we went to where the ghetto and the SS headquarters were there and uh, and then we um, we went uh, to Treblinka, uh, and uh, it was especially hard, I think, on the, the students, uh, the German students. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and we kept, uh, we, we would never refer to it as, as German. Uh, we would always say Nazi. This was the work of the Nazis, not the Germans. Um, uh, we went to Treblinka. Uh, as I remember, there were about 900,000 people killed it in Treblinka. Uh, we went down to uh, Krakow. Uh, the city of Krakow, I don't know if anybody's ever been there. Has anybody ever been to Krakow? It's just this beautiful city and it wasn't destroyed in the war. I think the, the German commander refused to, refused orders. It's a, so it's a beautiful, beautiful city. And from there we went out to Auschwitz and Birkenau. Uh, from there we went up to a small community in central Poland, uh, Chemlo. And uh, in Chemlo is a little town, like any like rural Wisconsin town, with a church in the middle of the thing. And, and there they, they herded uh, the local Jews, and uh, they killed about 50,000 local Jews uh, there. They would uh, bring them into the church and strip them of their clothes and their, all their stuff you know, uh, through one door. And then at the other door, they had a semi-truck. And then they would load them in there, and then they ran the gas pipe up into the back of the truck and and then um, they drive them down the road about two miles and then the, you know many of the people would be dead by then but a bunch wouldn't be they had a mass grave there we went to that field uh, where they were buried and um, you couldn't uh, like step a single step without stepping on a human bone shard you couldn't step without stepping on there were there were uh, bone fragments uh, everywhere there so it was really kind of an amazing kind of place. And, and I keep thinking about why I do you know, stuff like that. I took another group to um, uh, a student group to Australia, a group of native graduate students. We went to the Moore River camp. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the, the, uh, the rabbit proof fence, the video rabbit proof fence. Yeah, a very, very powerful video about um, what happened to the young Aboriginal students. But we, we went there, we went to that place where those kids were taken, where they were trained to be domestics. They had built a big fence around it, a big high fence around it, and, and that's where the parents, so the parents would come and they'd live like in the, in the, in the bush around there. And, um, and, and it was really funny, I had 24 native graduate students um, with on that trip, um, we, we came pulling into the camp. They knew nothing about the rabbit-proof fence. They knew nothing about where we were. But when we came pulling in there, the, the bus got just silent. It was just amazing. It was an amazing experience. So, so we went there. Um, um, I had taken a group out, a high school group out to, um, to uh, uh, in 1970, two or 73 out to Wounded Knee um, when uh, just after uh, the occupation 
uh, uh, just after the AIM, AIM was occup had occupied it and after all the firefights with the FBI and the Army and stuff like that, I took them out there and they got to like put their fingers in the bullet holes, you know, in the church and in the store and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, um, and I've been working with, um, this past weekend, I've been working the last two years, I decided to go back and work with young people again and, and I've been, uh, I'm a lead trainer for this thing called the Minnesota Indigenous Youth Freedom Project. And uh, there, if you're wondering why we use the word freedom, it's freedom from ourselves. And, um, and we, uh, uh, I had them last weekend and we, one of the things we, we're doing is, we, is we're, 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 we're teaching them some, we're doing some resilience things and one of those resilience things has to do with uh, Dr. Martin Brokenleg's circle of courage and that's a whole long story but one of the parts of that circle of courage is, is generosity and we want to model with them um, giving back without expecting anything in return, okay? And so we showed them the ABC uh, 2020 video, Children of the Plains. I don't know who's seen the video. Anybody here seen the video? And, um, and then um, we showed the video and, um, and the staff, um, there are a group of us, um, we, um, we started pledging um, do, to do something. Because I think when, 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 when I saw the video, um, you know, I saw myself as a young kid because um, the, the faces in, in the video were, I and mean, that, was, that was me, you know, that was those, those kids, um, everything that I saw um, was, you know, was me growing up. And so it was like confronting myself in the mirror. So we started pledging, we, we, there's a little group of us, and we, we, we came up with like $2,000, and, and then we said, um, we'd like the kids to go out and try to find uh, pledges for that. And, and the thing about generosity and not expecting anything in return, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, we would, we're, we're going to give it to either one of the kids in a video or some kind of charity. We're not exactly sure yet. We're vo kind of voting on it. Um, but we decided that um, when we raise this, whatever it is, that we're going to take these kids and we're going to bring them uh, back out to Wounded Knee to to give that gift because we want them to be able to see it. And we all remind them also that giving begins at home. But in this case, we'd like to, to show them that, um, that sometimes we need to reach out uh, to other places as well. Um, so, so they're in the lesson. So I get to return to uh, Pine Ridge again after, after all these years. Um, I'd like to close, if I could. I... Um, when I did the To Be Free book, I dedicated the, uh, the book to my granddaughters. So, because I, th I see that um, there's still a lot of work to do, um, that, um, that uh, my generation has been able to bring this struggle uh, so far and uh, we've we've made we've made some strides. Um, we still have um, we still have uh, racism is much much more uh, seems it's uh, very overt of course, but uh, people try to be sneaky about it nowadays. Uh, very covert. They do things like call our president a liar. They question his citizenship. Um, 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 they uh, refuse to stand when he enters a room. Um, all of that is a very sophisticated kind of racism that um, that we see nowadays. They they call it immigration. Um, they um, it, it's called uh, Islamic hearings before Congress. Um, it, it's couched in all different kinds of ways now, but it's but it's racism, um, and that's kind of what it is. So we've come a long ways. But we've also come a long ways, but we're going to turn it over uh, to our grandchildren. So if I had a reader for the final uh, one, and then I'll open it up for any questions if I could. Thank you. Just right here. This, this yeah. Right here. Yeah. This is called Free at Last. I dedicated the book to be free to my granddaughters, knowing that the struggle for equality will continue with their generation, that they will need to actively fight racism and all forms of intolerance. 
I know that they need to take Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, our collective dream, to be free at last and make it real, that we will hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. That is what we need to do as educators. We need to prepare young people for a world they cannot even imagine, a world that does not even exist, for a day when freedom will ring from every tribal center, in every one of our villages, and throughout our tribal nations. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we are free at last. Well, thanks for having me. I'll answer any questions if I could. Just make something up, and then, then, <laughs> and then I'll respond by making something up. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, when you were a boy growing up, did you embrace your culture and your language? Yeah. Or, so you didn't make attempts to fit in and deny? What I, you I was, um, I was uh, uh, today in today's language, I'd be considered a schoolboy. Um, you know, I was good at school. And, and I think uh, those of us who, in this room who are academics, that's why we're in academia, you know, because we were good at school. And uh, so I was good at school. And, uh, and I wasn't ever... Um, put under any kind of peer pressure from the, all the other kids on the res, um, you know, to not be good at school. I was um, blessed in a way that I was also good with my fists. Um, and, and when, no, because in, growing up on the res, you had, to, you had to know how to handle yourself because it, was, it, it could be kind of a rugged place. And, um, and if I would have been a, you know, a wimp, um, I may have gotten picked on for being good at school. But I was good at school. and. And I could be a, like a regular reser at the same time, and and um, and I did just fine. Yeah, I was never under any pressure um, to 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 do any of that. No, you know, my family. Of course, we were raised Catholic, and on, uh, and then when I was old enough to make my own decisions, I started going uh, to our ceremonies, um, which were banned, uh, which at that time were illegal. I mean, a lot of people in this country think that. Um, there's freedom of religion for everybody, but you know our tribal religions were against federal law until 1978, until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Um, so, um, you know, all our ceremonies were always held, but they were very much secret. Uh, you know, so I started going to those, um, and uh, yeah. Why, why would they need a separate act? Why weren't they protected by the First Amendment? I don't know. I don't know. This is uh, isn't uh, the Freedom of religion, uh, one of the Bill of Rights, isn't that in the Ten Commandments or whatever the hell it's called? <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to go back to the story when you were talking about your father being called chief, that yeah. it was mimicking him, yeah. and wondering what your opinion is of what's happening in Wisconsin right now with nicknames and logos oh, yeah. and mascots. Yeah. yeah, in Minnesota, of course, it was a similar effort. Um, um, during uh, during this that first initial discussion of mascots in in the state where I was from, at the time uh, Minnesota had a state board of education, and I was a um, member of the state board of education and representing uh, my congressional district, which was all of northern Minnesota where no one lives, <laughs> and um, um, except my few of my relatives. But anyway, um, so I represent that part of the state. And I, I, was, um, I wanted to leave it up to individual districts at the time, because there are certain districts that are native who've kept you know, those Indian names or brave names or whatever they were. And I figured that. But, but then my um, high school um, hockey team, the Cloquet Lumberjacks, uh, played the Grand Rapids Indians uh, for the sectional uh, championship. And, uh, and I remember uh, seeing the Grand Rapids Indian cheerleaders out there with their pink um, headdresses on, and, um, and then uh, uh, hearing the, cloquet fan, the Grand Rapids, the, the Cloquet fans, excuse me, hollering, scalp them Indians, you know, I'll kill those Indians, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and when the discussion came up at the board, um, I, um, um, I switched and was able to convince the rest of the board um, to, uh, to force school districts to change their names. At that time, there were 53 um, uh, schools in the state who had uh, uh, mascots. So, yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Hmm. I was saved. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you talked about how the gray system has become more sophisticated yeah. these days, and you gave an example of the president. Um, have you seen any of that or felt any of that specifically? Um, no, no, I, I encounter the usual stupidity, um, like uh, every once in a while um, somebody um, where I work will ask me which machine to play at the casino. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I don't know what to say actually. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Go there and lose money. I'll uh, get a bigger per capita check. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about your uh, children's books? Because the readings that you can find I mean, when I say children's books, I think books. Oh, yeah, yeah. But your son will be different. Well, um, um, I try to layer them. Um, you know, like, um, uh, I, I don't know if I've copied anything from anybody, but I try to layer them with meaning so that young people can get something out of them. And then when adults read them, they can get you know, the deeper layers of meaning from them. So they are layered in that way. And, um, and I did, uh, The Four Hills of Life is an old Ojibwe story about, um, about our, the human life cycle. And I wrote it because um, I wanted uh, young uh, native kids to know uh, why we're here the Ojibwe story of why we're here. And that story, it's a very simple children's story. It really explains um, why we're here. And told, um, it's a very short story, and I figured out a way to make a book of it. And then uh, I did a book called the, 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 it was called the Good Path. And it's based on, um, it's based on um, um, these qualities of, um, these, these, quali these qualities of being um, that were given to each human being in Ojibwe thinking at the time of our creation. Um, and um, it's the very essence of the creator, um, um, the essence of the mystery um, that uh, you see in Ojibwe thinking, um, uh, we aren't born with any mortal sin. We're born, we're born um, with the creator's essence. And it's that essence um, that I put in the story on the good path. It's those those things that we're born with. Um, because um, it's a lot like Eastern philosophy where, um, where um, we're always telling young people, you know, you need to look, look to this person because they're this wonderful person. And you, if you watch them, you, they'll do, you know, they'll, they do all these wonderful things and you'll learn how to do that. And, and this thinking, of course, is very Eastern in that way and it's very native, but it's just the opposite of that. It's that everything you need is already there. You were born with that. You just need to go in here and and find it and bring it out. So, yeah, so, yeah. Anybody else? That's it, huh? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.